Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to today's field hearing. I want to say thank you to Southeast Technical Institute for hosting this field hearing, and thank to, thanks to all of you for coming. Um, I've convened this hearing to both explore the build-out of high-speed broadband services and to examine the numerous benefits this broadband connectivity brings to South Dakota communities. After previously serving as the chairman of the Senate Commerce Committee at the beginning of this year, I became chairman of the Senate Subcommittee on Communications, Technology, Innovation, and the Internet. While I spent considerable time on this issue as the chairman of the full committee, given its importance, the first subcommittee hearing I convened was on the state of rural broadband in America. Today I'm excited to discuss this important topic right here at home. Over the years, as I have worked on this issue, I've heard from stakeholders who are on the ground building out communications networks, deploying infrastructure, and bringing to market new technologies that are transforming our everyday lives. I've also heard from community and tribal leaders, small businesses, hospitals, schools, and everyday South Dakotans experiencing the benefits of reliable broadband connectivity. Unfortunately, access to the benefits of broadband delivered services is often determined by where you live, with rural areas trailing those who are in more densely populated areas. The Federal Communications Commission plays an important role in helping to build out rural broadband services through a number of programs. I'm very pleased that last December, the FCC, as part of efforts led by Commissioner Carr, unanimously took action to enable the continued deployment of broadband in rural communities, both here in South Dakota and across the country, by ensuring that adequate and predictable support to the high-cost program. In fact, just last month, the FCC authorized over $705 million in support to South Dakota carriers serving some of the most rural areas of our state. I'm confident these new dollars will be deployed in an efficient and effective manner. Rural telecommunications companies in South Dakota are leaders in providing quality communication services to their customers. They cover more than 76% of the geography of the state and more than three quarters of their customers have access to high-speed broadband services. Accurate broadband maps are also essential for these programs to effectively target truly underserved or unserved areas, I should say. In July, the Commerce Committee advanced a bill I sponsored with Chairman Wicker called the Broadband Data Act to address the challenges with the current broadband availability maps. Additionally, the FCC recently took steps to update its maps consistent with the goals of the Broadband Data Act. As many of you know, having reliable connectivity and the infrastructure in place throughout all parts of the country presents new opportunities beyond streaming your favorite TV show without buffering. For many businesses, access to reliable broadband services means tapping into markets that have never, that have been before unreachable. It means new educational opportunities for students and educators in rural areas, and so much more. The use of precision agriculture encompasses the use of robotics, field sensors, remote monitoring, and the Internet of Things, and other technologies that enable farmers to manage their fields, significantly increase their crop yields, eliminate overlap in operations, and reduce inputs such as seed, fertilizer, pesticides, water, and fuel. Telehealth services help reduce costs for both patients and health care providers. Mobile health applications allow patients to track their overall health, and telemedicine helps overcome geographic barriers, which are common in more rural areas. All of these applications are the result of having a reliable broadband network. And as we look ahead, to next generation fixed broadband and wireless services, it is critical we have the workforce and proper infrastructure in place to bring communities further into the 21st century. That's why it's important to have forward-thinking individuals like Mayor Paul Tenhaken here in Sioux Falls who sees the opportunities that next generation services will bring. He's worked aggressively to lower barriers and impediments to ensure that companies will invest in Sioux Falls and that type of mentality will help the United States, including more rural areas, ultimately see the full benefits of broadband capabilities today and in the future. It's encouraging that the FCC's recent broadband deployment report shows the number of Americans lacking access to a fixed broadband connection has continued to decline. But this issue will remain a priority for me until we've closed that gap entirely for everyone who wants access to broadband and the benefits that it brings. As folks here in South Dakota know, rural America has a lot to offer and with the potential for new and more efficient broadband infrastructure, there will be even more meaningful opportunities for advancements in health care, agriculture, financial services, education, and economic development. Today, we're joined by a panel of expert witnesses to discuss these benefits and the state of rural broadband deployment. FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr, who, as I mentioned, 
has had a very busy schedule meeting with uh, a number of South Dakotans over the past 48 hours. And I'll let him describe the amount of real estate that he has covered. Um, but he has uh, climbed towers in South Dakota, wind towers, so he's been high up in the uh, sky. And uh, this week he got a chance to go underground uh, a mile, 5,000 feet, at the research facility out in the Black Hills. I appreciate uh, very much the uh, interest that he's shown in closing the div digital divide and his vision to make the innovations that come with these services a reality. And he has worked hard to understand these issues uh, from a South Dakota perspective, and we're grateful for that. Dr. Griffiths and Dakota State University are ensuring our advanced telecommunications networks and the services they offer are protected as we face new cyber challenges. Uh, Ms. Deanna Larson, who's president of Avera eCare, is helping advance telehealth services across many areas in the Midwest. Dr. Michael Adeline, together with South Dakota State University, is preparing young men and women for careers that bring agriculture and emerging technologies together. And Mr. Mark Schlanta of SDN Communications and Mr. Craig Snyder of Vicor uh, t Teleconstruction are working to deploy broadband services and the related infrastructure that will bring South Dakota the benefits of the innovations that we'll be talking about here today. I'm also delighted to be able to welcome my colleague and neighbor from down south, Senator Deb Fisher, who's here today to hear from folks who work every day to bring these services to the people of rural America. Rural Nebraska faces many of the same challenges we have here in South Dakota when deploying these services. In states like South Dakota, and Nebraska can play a leading role in the technological revolution, and I am eager to continue to do my part and to work with Senator Fisher and others as we make that a reality. Senator Fisher is a, a leading role on the Commerce Committee, and uh, her expertise and uh, comes from the tele I should say the um, infrastructure world and the transportation world where she was a leader on those issues in Nebraska and has continued to do that uh, in the United States Senate on, uh, on the Commerce Committee, but also is very active, uh, as I said, on these uh, technology, technology issues and internet issues and uh, the many uh, policy matters that come in front of our committee. So I'm delighted to have her uh, join us today and I look forward to our discussion. And I wanna thank all of you who have come out for being here. Um, and I'm going to turn to uh, Commissioner Carr in just a moment and let him open this up. But I wanted to just acknowledge again Senator Fisher and if any remarks that you want to make to... Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here in South Dakota, our neighbors to the north, and uh, share some information from a distinguished panel that we have here today about the importance of infrastructure. Now, usually when people say infrastructure, at least in my world, they think of uh, roads and bridges. Well, I think of broadband as well. I live uh, south of Murdo, South Dakota. I'm in the Sand Hills in Cherry County. We have a cattle ranch. And uh, yeah, you can turn on your cell phone and not have service. So uh, we fully understand if we are going to be competitive in rural America, we need to have that infrastructure. And it's not just roads and bridges, it is broadband that will keep our communities growing, keep our young people at home, and to grow the strengths that we have in rural South Dakota and in rural Nebraska. Senator Thune has been a leader in all of these areas. It is a pleasure to uh, continue to work with him on the Commerce Committee. He was a fabulous chairman of the committee and advancing the needs that we see all across the United States when it comes to these issues. And it is certainly a pleasure to be here with him today uh, at this field hearing here in Sioux Falls. So thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Fisher. And um, she does live straight south of Murdo. So that, that's, a, that's a way south of Murdo. <laughs> <That's not laughs> um, and I want you to know there are lots of uh, there are lots of uh, jackrabbit and coyote and other fans in the audience who are probably some Husker fans too. So we. <laughs> uh, I'm going to start, um, and we'll just give our our panelists an opportunity to make some remarks uh, on my left and your right with uh, our commissioner. As I said, Commissioner Carr has been in South Dakota now for a few days, and he's been out here a number of times in the past. And it's always a pleasure to welcome him to South Dakota. And I know uh, many of you in this room have helped uh, roll out the welcome mat for him and uh, made his uh, experience here a meaningful one. And I know that uh, he's learned a lot from, from those visits. So uh, Commissioner Carr, it's always good to have you here. Welcome and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Thune, for the invitation to testify. It's great to be back with you. 
in South Dakota. I want to commend you and the committee for holding this hearing on rural broadband in the new era of innovation that is bringing to rural communities. Your strong leadership on rural broadband has expanded economic opportunities for rural America. I also want to recognize and extend my thanks to Senator Fisher. I had the privilege of visiting Nebraska with Senator Fisher about a year ago, and we learned there how fast internet connections are able to just transform rural communities. Spending time like this outside of DC, hearing directly from community members impacted by our policies is critical. There's no substitute for seeing firsthand the challenges that come with building broadband in some of the hardest to serve parts of the country. And there's nothing that underscores the importance of all of our efforts to solve that challenge, to close the digital divide, than seeing how many in rural America are using a high-speed connection to innovate and create economic opportunity, whether it's in agriculture, in healthcare, or in education. And I'll deviate a little bit from my testimony to highlight how this week, it really underscored all of those points. We started out on the western part of the state uh, in Leeds, South Dakota, an old 1800s gold mine that is now home to some of the most cutting edge, innovative, Nobel Prize winning science work. One reason is they've been able to run a fiber connection a mile straight down this mine shaft to connect those research labs. Uh, so what was old uh, back in the 1800s has been able to be reinvigorated, creating massive jobs in that part of the state, thanks at least in part to a broadband connection. As we moved uh, further east, we spent some time down in the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. As you know, it's a vast, vast area along the border with Nebraska about uh, the size of Rhode Island and Delaware combined with about 100 times fewer people. Immense challenges with connecting that community. And I was there with Golden West and they were showing us how they're replacing old copper lines, that they're on track now to connect uh, nearly every customer location in that vast area uh, with high-speed fiber. And we saw there the difference that it makes. We visited a IHS hospital and we connected through a fiber link back here to Sioux Falls to Avera eCare. And they have some of the world's leading specialists located there. With that broadband HD video connection, they can video in and provide specialty care, including mental health and behavioral health that simply would be unavailable uh, on the reservation without that broadband connection. Moving further east again, we stopped last night in uh, Midland, South Dakota. There's a family there, the Hostetlers. Uh, it's a third generation farmer. Uh, his wife, we met Misty, she works uh, in a high tech IT field. And before she got broadband to her family home on the farm, she had to drive a thousand miles a week to commute to her job. That was probably gonna be unsustainable in the long run. And now she can work remotely right from the field, right from the home on the farm. And her husband, Brian, took us up into one of his connected combines. And really to be a farmer today, you have to understand uh, not just agriculture, but really be a tech expert and a science expert. And he showed us how these connected combines now, when you get the connectivity to the farm, they can make precise inch by inch adjustments to uh, seeding depth, pace uh, of seeding, and it's resulting generally about a 30% boost in productivity on the farm. Uh, and, and so it's a real life example, I think, whether it's a high tech field uh, or farming, when you get a broadband connection to your home, the difference that it can make. And so for communities around the country, broadband is giving you know, families a chance to improve their lives, to innovate and expand their opportunities. And we've been engaged in efforts at the FCC to help build on and expand what we're seeing. As Chairman Thude noted, we've been opening up millions of dollars for South Dakota and across the Great Plains to build out internet infrastructure and it's making a difference. Uh, the digital divide closed by about 20% last year alone. Internet speeds are up about 40% in the country. New small cell builds went from 13,000 in 2017 to over 60,000 uh, last year. And so we're on track to lead the world in 5G now, which is this next generation of connectivity. And for us, the finish line is not the time New York or San Francisco gets next gen connectivity. It's when every single community gets a fair shot. Uh, and along the way, it's creating jobs. And not just when you get the connection, but building out this inter internet infrastructure. And Craig with Vicor will tell us a bit about that, how industry could add about 20,000 new jobs today. Uh, good paying, solidly middle class jobs, building out this infrastructure of the future. And I was up uh, 
100 feet or so today with some of Craig's crew, putting in a new wireless antenna above Mitchell, South Dakota, that's beaming almost 100 megabit per second service uh, right in that area. And telehealth is another uh, big opportunity that comes with it. We mentioned the, a very e-care demonstration that I saw, and we're pursuing a pilot program at the FCC, the Connected Care pilot program, that's looking to open up $100 million to support not just broadband to brick and mortar healthcare facilities, but there's this shift in healthcare going. It's effectively the, the shift that we saw from blockbuster video to Netflix, where high quality care can now be delivered directly to the home. So we're looking to build on our existing support mechanisms by funding the connections needed directly to a patient, whether it's their smartphone or their tablet, so they don't even have to travel to a facility to get some of the qualifying care. So those are some of the interesting things we're seeing from precision ag, to education, to healthcare, where broadband makes a difference. And there's so much uh, grit and ingenuity and determination in rural communities. And when you give them a fighting chance with a broadband connection, uh, it is so impressive what happens. And that's why we're going to keep fighting in DC with the leadership of Senator Thune uh, and Senator Fisher to make sure that we get this fully across the finish line and close the digital divide. Thank you, Commissioner Carr. Uh, next up is uh, Dr. Jose Marie Griffiths, who, as I said, is the president of Dakota State University and has a, a broad, vast experience in the world of cyber and uh, is doing some really wonderful things over there at DSU. Um, and so we're delighted to have you here and uh, invite you to make some remarks. Thank Dr. you, Griffiths. Senator Thune and Senator Fisher, for the opportunity to testify today on this important topic. Uh, in my longer written comments, I have some compelling real-life stories that illustrate the power and importance of broadband connectivity in education, healthcare, business, community development, etc. But my spoken comments today will focus on some stunning facts and figures that illustrate that we're at a crisis point in this country. Admittedly, we're making progress, but we've still a way to go. A crippling digital divide exists between rural and urban areas and in some respects it's growing. Rural areas that have secure, reliable broadband connectivity are indeed being transformed by it and are experiencing a new age of innovation. Uh, however, generally rural areas are being cut off from life in the 21st century. Rural America that's experiencing the benefits of broadband connectivity like Dakota State University and our host community of Madison and Lake County here in South Dakota are making sure that we have four components. Reliable, fast, secure, adequate capacity broadband internet service. Reliable, fast, secure, adequate capacity cell phone service. Technology services at costs we can sustainably afford. And a highly skilled tech workforce. Unfortunately, many rural communities don't have one or more of these components. And instead of innovation and hopeful futures, they're more and more being left behind, attempting to access 21st century electronic resources with 20th century technology. A very important point here. This lack of connectivity doesn't just impact those living in rural areas, it impacts the economic success of the entire United States. According to a study by Deloitte for Facebook, every day that one person is not connected to the internet, America loses $2.30 of potential economic activity. And that means if we could solve the rural-urban digital divide today, tomorrow we'd have the potential to add $83 million per day or $30 billion a year to the US economy. According to a recent Pew Charitable Trust study, almost 60% of rural Americans report that access to reliable, secure, high-speed internet is a problem in their communities. In contrast, fewer than 20% of urban Americans report this as an issue. Reliable, secure broadband has indeed ushered in an area of innovation and transformation for those who have access. For example, students who have internet connectivity at home are 10% more likely to earn a high school diploma and college degree and will earn more than $2 million more over their lifetimes. 82% of US households have internet access, but only 65% of rural households with a computer can get high-speed internet access. For Native Americans living on reservations or tribal lands, the percentage is even worse. Only 53% with a computer have any way of getting internet access. So getting broadband connectivity to that population would be a powerful way to raise the existing unacceptable 65% high school graduation rate and raise earning power. Advanced placement classes give bright, motivated high school students better preparation for college work and lowers the cost, their cost to degree. Hundreds of AP courses are available online, but only 47% of rural school districts have no secondary schools involved in those courses. In comparison, fewer than 3% of urban districts and only 5% of suburban areas have no students taking AP courses. 
Technology in the classroom individualizes learning and engages students. However, approximately 41% of schools, almost all in rural areas, representing 47% of US K-12 students, do not yet have connectivity at even the FCC's short-term bandwidth goal of 100 megabits per second per thousand students. Educational technology makes it possible for one teacher to teach multiple subjects at multiple levels, engaging in motivating ways. Rural areas are facing a chronic shortage of teachers and technology deserts make it worse. It's no wonder that 39% of rural schools struggle to fill teaching positions in every subject and over 60% of high school teachers in rural areas leave teaching after their first three years an additional 20% after five. An unemployed person who has the internet at home will be employed seven weeks faster than one who doesn't and will earn more than $5,000 in additional income annually. Zip codes in the bottom 10% of population density pay up to 37% more on average for residential wired broadband than those in the top 10% of density. IT professionals in a community transform that community. One IT person can support multiple small businesses in addition to training employees to promote digital adoption. At Dakota State, we've set a goal of doubling our enrollment in our Beacon College of Computer and Cyber Sciences to increase the number of tech professionals available in rural areas. We've also been strengthening the tech workforce pipeline. This fall, we launched a new computer and cyber sciences academy with the Sioux Falls School District that will enable high school students to take college level cyber courses while still in high school, lowering the cost and shortening the time it'll take them to earn a tech degree. This is part of uh, another initiative, the South Dakota Partnership for Student Success, a program with multiple educational pathways to get more people into the tech workforce. Another new endeavor, the Madison Cyber Labs is focused on economic and workforce development by retaining our graduates in South Dakota, along with business and population recruitment to the state. Rural areas that can keep their talented high school and college graduates keep intellectual capital and leadership. Broadband connectivity opens doors for these young adults to take well-paying telecommuting jobs and launch on online entrepreneurial enterprises all from their home communities. But without it, the rural brain drain will only get worse. So broadband connectivity is critical to the United States continuing to lead in this era of innovation. As a country, we must decide whether we're going to make it possible for all to have equal access to high-speed internet or abandon rural users to slow smartphones, library parking lots, and unlimited reliable home connections. In this ever more competitive global marketplace, the United States needs $83 million more of economic activity a day. And we must make sure that every child in America, including those in rural areas, has an education that well prepares them to lead this country through this century and into the next. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Griffiths. And uh, I would add that our, uh, the person who does our IT operations in our offices in Washington is a proud uh, DSU grad, of course. Um, Next up is uh, Deanna Larson, who, as I said, is the president of Avera eCare, and, um, and I think it goes without saying that uh, Avera has been a pioneer when it comes to uh, the things that you can do with telemedicine, uh, telehealth, and uh, treat uh, people across our state and the region um, through technology, and they continue to, to make advances and lead the way. So thank you for being here, and look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Senator Thune. And I want to thank uh, Senator Thune and S Senator Fisher and actually uh, Chairman Carr, uh, really for, for thousands of people, tens of thousands of people whose lives have been impacted, their health care lives, their family lives, lives of clinicians, by really having this broadband available to them when a crisis occurs. And if you could just hear one story of one life saved because there was a connection from that facility they were at to the facility where I am here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. It should make, your, you, it should make you feel very good every day for the commitment that you've made in making sure that broadband is a continued extension. So from all of those thousands of people, uh, please hear that heartfelt thank you. It's very important to them and it's very important to us. So deep thank you. Well, we often think about broadband as an, in, um, as an expansion in terms of needing to reach rural homes and underserved areas but in, and creating equal access on online business, all of those things that are very important. You've heard some things about already. In the realm of healthcare, broadband is more than equal access. It really is a matter of saving lives. 20% of Americans live and work in rural American communities. Just like um, their urban, urban out, uh, counterparts, they experience cancer, heart disease, trauma, stroke, um, very severe injuries that are always um, at the risk of being life-threatening. In today's specialized healthcare 
systems, people either must drive to get that uh, special care, miles and miles, or forgo the care they need. Staffing in uh, this kind of care in rural communities is just not a feasible opportunity. First of all, there aren't enough specialists to go around, and second of all, the population wouldn't support having those specialists available to them in their own community. To bridge these gaps, Severa has developed a far-reaching telemedicine program that is looked at as the world's model. To our knowledge, there's no one else doing what we're doing with the secure and interactive video capabilities that are offered. We started this about 25 years ago, and it began with just a simple consult from Sioux Falls, South Dakota to Flandreau. Um, that pilot back in 1993 started the journey of understanding what rural providers need and support and how those living in those communities should have equal access to specialty care. Today at Avery Care, we not only do the medical specialty, um, clinic to clinic, but we also have um, boarded ED physicians providing care to emergency rooms, pharmacists, uh, ICU care providers, long-term care providers living in, uh, for those living in senior living communities, behavioral health specialists, uh, hospitalists, school nursing, and correctional care. All of those services going directly into the place where the patient needed the most and bringing the specialists to them immediately. It's become the most extensive telehealth network. Right now, we serve more than 350 communities with more than 650 different telemedicine locations, and that's across 25 states. Our emergency program is um, in which our local teams can provide immediate access around the clock supports 15% of the nation's critical access facilities. And I began by saying broadband is a matter of saving lives. So because of medicine so advanced, it's impossible for one physician to be the do-it-all. There are many situations and when the right in intervention, such as a PEDS provider, a cardiac um, provider, a pulmonary provider, in the right place and time <clears throat> can make that life-saving difference. For example, in our ICU program, around-the-clock computerized algorithms notifies critical care intensivists of changes and through those notifications, they can support the local bedside in making the necessary changes to either reduce length of stay in the critical care unit or um, actually uh, to make things get better quicker because they notified the physician sooner. So I think you can all relate to that. If you have an illness yourself, the earlier you go to the doctor and get intervention, the more likely to have a quick turnaround. E-Care Pharmacy supports, supports care locally by supporting physicians in ordering medications and reducing medication errors and advanced drug events. Um, the specialty and emergency port support in medically underserved areas is important to bring up. Uh, we do serve the Indian reservation communities and um, in supporting those disparities across those areas, we know that we are supporting care for cancer, uh, diabetes care, as well as reducing risk of suicide. Um, all of these services really allow our patients to stay close for home whenever, close to home for care whenever that's possible. And we do that pro by providing an extension of care to the local providers. That's important to know. Oftentimes we think about a business that's replacing a local rural business, and what we're really doing is augmenting that. We couldn't do that without broadband. We find that in more than 80% of the cases when we have telemedicine available to the local providers, we're able to reduce transfers to tertiary care facilities. That's important because tertiary facilities are often overloaded anyway, and secondarily, anytime you can maintain care in the local community, you can um, actually enhance or support that local economics. The practice of medicine is very demanding, and the repeating cadence of what goes on in a rural provider's life is very important to consider. Not only are they up all day and night working in clinic and then going into the emergency, second of all, they're working in isolation. So all of that does relate to an overall burnout. And we want to mention that when we can, um, training our medical students here in South Dakota, bringing them into eCare um, for a look at what telehealth is, maybe as a receiver of telehealth or provider, is actually preparing them to go out and have, understand what it's like to have a telehealth colleague and hoping that we can recruit and retain those physicians in those rural communities. I'd just like to close with, um, without these broadband services, none of this would be available and um, all of these individuals would not have had the opportunity for treatment. For those reasons, I'm really proud to give testimony today and to support the expanded broadband and the funding that it's providing. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Deanna. 
Uh, next up is uh, Mr. Mark Slanta, who, as I said earlier, is the CEO of SDN Communications, and uh, he's been that, I think, since 2000, is that right? Um, and, and has led efforts to expand uh, SDN's network across South Dakota and into neighboring states and really increased both business and institutional access to broadband connectivity and related services. So we're delighted to have him here and look forward to hearing from you. Please proceed, Mark. Chairman Thune, uh, thank you for inviting SDN to participate in today's hearing. And Senator Fisher and Commissioner Carr, thank you for joining us as well. This year, SDN Communications marks 30 years in business. The story of South Dakota's access to rural broadband can't be told without SDN and its member companies' investment in over 50,000 miles of fiber facilities. That's enough to circle the earth twice. I'd like to take a moment to describe how SDN and the 17 independent telephone companies that own SDN and our partners are growing that fiber optic network dramatically as we move forward. In this hearing, I hope we'll have time to further discuss the needs for greater alignment and teamwork to drive innovation in broadband applications. First, I'd like to remind everyone uh, who our collective network serves. Our companies cover 80% of South Dakota's geography and a third of the population. We're not talking about the population centers, yet our companies aggressively combat the digital divide. By the end of 2021, we will have fiber to the home, farm, ranch, and business in over 93% of the locations in the service areas of the independent phone companies. Their investment over the past five years represents in excess of a half a billion dollars. Further demonstrating their aggressive fiber deployment, when Governor Kristi Noem launched her $5 million Connect South Dakota grants, her administration quickly realized our companies have or will have fiber to the most remote farms and ranches in the state. Instead, her team asked, to, asked our companies to help provide broadband in relatively populated areas north of Pier, around Watertown, and even here in Minnehaha County. In fact, the stories from those unserved areas of Minnehaha County and Hughes counties might be the most impactful. At the northern edge of Minnehaha County, a large dairy farm had struggled to implement technology into its operations because of its lack of broadband services. Additionally, I've been told the stories of rural families in Minnehaha County must take their cell phones and other technology into relatives' homes in Garrison in order to have access to broadband and do necessary updates to their devices. In Hughes County, roughly 700 homes will now have fiber to the prim available to them. Six of the eight Connect South Dakota grants Governor Christy Noem's administration issued went to our companies to build in those unserved and underserved service areas. Venture Communications received the largest grant, 54% uh, of the governor's $5 million. Cheyenne River uh, Tribal Telephone Authority received another $475,000 to bring broadband to unserved Timber Lake. Mitchell Telecom is plowing fiber to serve housing developments around Mitchell with a grant of $441,000. Uh, RC Communications and ITC are serving parts of Coddington County, and Alliance Communications is serving Minnehaha. Our companies have also been aggressive in applying for federal reconnect grants. Valley Communications, working along Highway 14, SDN Communications in the Black Hills, and Premier Communications, serving parts of Union County. We look forward to hearing more about those grants. I recently listened to national experts speak at the South Dakota Telecommunication Association's annual meeting. Speakers who look far into the future warn there's a disconnect between the predictions of future broadband needs and what can be delivered across various wireless services. These speakers say fixed wireless, 5G cellular, satellite, they all play a role, but they will not fully meet the demand of, the, of all broadband services. The speaker's position was, that the only way to future-proof broadband services is a fiber connection to every home, farm, ranch, and business here in South Dakota and across the nation. Fiber-based networks are the solution to a comprehensive broadband infrastructure needed to support the innovations we seek in the fields of telehealth, e-commerce, online education, and precision agriculture. Again, today I hope we can spend some time reviewing at some level six key elements that I feel will continue to drive broadband innovation forward. These elements are with last mile networks, having the right policies that encourage broadband build out in un and unserved rural and urban markets, 
middle mile networks. Development and coordination are needed to provide clear paths for the data and applications that can be enabled with the last mile investments. In my opinion, it would be a shame to see last mile investments slowed by poor middle mile policy. The Rural Development Opportunity Fund may become a vehicle to extend middle mile networks into areas where last mile networks are desperately needed. I'd like to see progressive data targets as we look into the future, 2020, 2025, and beyond. I think we also need to continue to focus on making sure we have good data as we look at the areas that uh, where adequate broadband exists and does not exist. Having that good data will be key in developing future policy. Certainly coordination among agencies and the removal of other barriers associated with broadband, broadband development will help us all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schlenta. Um, next up is Mr. Craig Schneider, uh, as Chief Executive Officer of Vicor Teleconstruction, and uh, he's the founder and CEO of Sioux Falls Tower and Communications, which is now known as Vicor, um, and the company celebrated its 30th anniversary this April. Uh, and I uh, had an opportunity to, to be out there, as did the commissioner, and um, has been a leading provider of wireless infrastructure, providing services in more than 30 states across the United States. So um, we're delighted to have you here. Uh, please proceed, Mr. Schneider. Thank you, Senator Thune, for inviting me to speak today, and, and Senator Fisher for being a part of this. And for uh, Commissioner Carr, who somebody hashtagged him today as Carr Works. <laughs> if you follow F F Commissioner Carr on Twitter or <laughs> LinkedIn or Instagram, you know he's all over the place. He's up on towers and he's underground now. Uh, I think he's got a couple of miles of spread between the farthest place underground to 2,000 feet above. And uh, so we really appreciate his leadership on the commission. Um, Vicor Teleconstruction, formerly Sioux Falls Tower, you may, may not know us, but we're the guys who build the vertical infrastructure. Mark builds the horizontal infrastructure. We build the vertical that uh, makes your cell phones work. Uh, so that includes these galvanized steel towers and all these antenna systems that you maybe just see a blinking light in the distance. If you see one of those, Vicor and, and companies like ours have done that. It's been my privilege for the last 30 years to witness the build out of cellular. I, I just coincidentally got into this industry when it was just starting in South Dakota and put up some of the very first towers. In those days, we just had one tower in every community. Uh, and then eventually they built them on highway corridors and, and are filling the gaps. But even over 30 years, there's still a lot of white spaces, as Dr. Griffiths has, has uh, talked to us about, both with fiber and also with mobile broadband. And we're trying to fill those as best we can uh, and as quickly as we can, but there's always impediments. Um, I like to liken the wireless infrastructure build out to, to, of today to the uh, electric build out of uh, 70 years ago. Uh, I had a, par a partner when I, when we founded uh, Vicor, formerly Sioux Falls Tower, that actually didn't have power into his home in rural Stickney until he was 12 years old. And he used to tell us these stories, and he was about uh, 20 years older than me, but, and I'm like, you can't be serious. You, you had to have power, but no, he didn't. They waited for power to come, and what did they do in, the, in, in pr preparation for that? They, put the, they bought the appliances at Sears, they had the lights put in, and then they just waited for those poles to come down their rural road, and they just anticipated that. Well, we have many people in rural America today that are doing the exact same thing with, with wireless broadband or even wired broadband. They want it so much, but they just can't get it quick enough because it's expensive to, to do this big build out. We also have people, uh, and we read about them every day in the news that say, not in my backyard. They do not like that, that infrastructure. They think it's ugly. And it's really interesting because while we have these big galvanized steel towers holding overhead power wires and they're not even noticed, another uh, group of people will say, well, I don't want a tower. I mean, that's ugly. We don't want that. And there's only one of those. And there might be dozens of these other towers they're looking at. They're very much very similar. And so it's kind of a mentality shift that we have to overcome uh, but thankfully, we're getting more and more people. And just like uh, Senator Fisher said before in her comments, she lives on a ranch south of Murdo where 
uh, Governor Thune grew up, but we quite like a ways. We say South of Valentine. Okay, <laughs> South of Valentine, all right. <laughs> if we're in South Dakota, we can say Myrtle, yeah. she can say Valentine, <laughs> that's, right. that's her choice. But anyway, and I asked her, well, how many bars of coverage do you have? And she says, oh, we, like zero or one. I mean, not enough, just enough to send text messages. If you have one bar, you can get out a text, but you can't get online and you can't really talk on you know, voice. So we have a lot of work to do. Thankfully, more and more people are saying, instead of not in my backyard, please in my backyard. Now in some cities, they're not saying that, but, uh, and even sometimes on the reservations, they're not saying that, but uh, we have some work to do there. But we are thankfully uh, partnering with industry and government to close the digital divide. We have a ton to do and there's no time to waste. Uh, technology is advancing at the speed of thought. I mean, we have some really smart people working on things that we don't even know uh, where it's gonna go yet. Um, so we continue to, while we're continuing to close the gap in this digital divide in rural America, in what I refer to as the white spaces in our industry, uh, we also have this really awesome technology that's available now called 5G, fifth generation wireless. So when, when you're on your phone today, you're, you're, use, you're either on 3G or 4G, you don't always know. Uh, but this 5G is, is now on the cusp of, uh, of rollout. Oh man, I gotta hurry up here. Um, so what does com companies like Vicor do? We put up that infrastructure. Um, we, have not, we represent just one of 900 companies in the National Association of Tower Erectors, uh, commonly referred to as Nate. Uh, so my, my voice uh, is, uh, is just an echo of those other 899 plus companies out there. Uh, we need more workforce. The biggest bottleneck to Vicor's um, ability to do, to help build out this rural infrastructure and even this the infrastructure in the cities is people. And so our plea is how can we find a way to open up the door to more and more workers? And we really applaud Southeast Technical Institute who is hosting us today this beautiful facility, they are presently working on one of the first programs in the United States to train workers. And we encourage them to do that. If some of you are, are here today and you have the financial means to support them through uh, grants or uh, scholarships to, to future students, we're hoping to uh, launch that program in January. They'll be using the Vicor facility, our training center, state-of-the-art wonderful facility to help train those students. Um, so what are we asking for? First off, we commend Commissioner Carr for doing such a wonderful job of, of highlighting the challenges that we face. Um, just like Rural Electric was getting built out years ago, we need um, your help. There is a bill in Congress, Senator Thune and Senator Fisher, that's uh, before the House right now. We would love to see a sponsorship from the Senate. It's uh, H.R. 1848, C Communications Training Act of 2019 bipartisan with uh, Democrat Senator uh, Congressman Lowesback and Republican Mullen. It does require funding and I understand from Alex that funding in the Senate means you have to find, you have to cut it off from, you have to take money from somewhere else to put it in. So we understand that, but it would provide 20 million um, per year and I think that'd be a really great start. So thank you so much and sorry I went over time. <laughs> thank you Mr. Sn okay. Snyder. Um, and uh, last up is the, the good gentleman from South Dakota State University, uh, Dr. Mice, Michael Adelaine, as I said, and um, he is, uh, has been a faculty member at SDSU since 1990 uh, and now serves as the Vice President for Technology and Security at SDSU. And so we, we welcome you here, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks Thank for you. coming. Good afternoon, Chairman Thune and Senator Fisher. Thank you for the invitation to testify today. I would like to address specifically the intersection of broadband connectivity and precision agriculture. Precision agriculture is based on collecting data in real time and adjusting farm or ranch operations to, to correspond to the new information. Sensors can provide data on multiple aspects of agricultural enterprise, whether it be temperature, soil moisture, or nutrient availability for plant growth. Sensors could also provide data on animal health, feed conversion, and or performance. When we speak of improving connectivity, we need to talk about the last mile, ending at the farm or ranch. 
So many times connectivity is described by what is available in the nearest local community. Once you are outside that area, broadband availability can drop off significantly. For precision agriculture to have the impact that agricultural scientists believe it can, data, and I mean big data, will need to flow freely from the field to the farm office, up to the cloud, back to the operation in near real time. We can now analyze plant images to detect some plant diseases up to two days before the human eye can spot the problem. Being able to quickly move thousands of high resolution images acquired close to the plants in the field currently is a major barrier to widespread adoption. South Dakota farmers planted approximately 13.5 million acres of corn, soybeans, winter wheat, spring wheat, and sunflowers in 2019. One day of hyper uh, specular imagery of every South Dakota crop acre with a coarse resolution of one pixel representing one square centimeter would be a huge yield of data. To put the challenge into perspective, if the imagery was acquired when the sun was at optimum angle between 10 and 2, it would take 1,500 high-speed fiber optic connections like the 100 gig connection SSU has to move images to its computers for processing now. Mark, you had a challenge there. <laughs> Another way to look at it is if agricultural researchers wanted to collect all the data possible from a single plant, that would be 18.4 gigabytes per plant or 432 terabytes of data on the average field. Put it in perspective, the Library of Congress holds about 15 terabytes of data. So the average cornfield holds 28 times as much data to be processed in the growing season. Because South Dakota has a highly variable production environment witnessed by the phrase, just wait a minute, the weather will change. <laughs> Producers have become early adopters of technology to deal with the variability. We strongly believe they will embrace new technologies and it can make a difference if we have the bandwidth. A consulting company projected that precision agriculture is expected to increase gross state production by additional $615 million to $1.5 billion from crop production alone in the next 10 years. I would like to say that SDSU is deeply committed to supporting precision agriculture, which is with its first in the nation precision ag program an investment by donors, we will be building an innovation technology facility with a commitment of over $46 million. Senator Dethune, thank you for this opportunity on behalf of not only South Dakota State University, but also the people of South Dakota we serve. And we thank you very much, Dr. Adeline, for, again, for being here. And uh, so there are Tell me again, the Library of Congress. And, 15, 15 terabytes. And, and, and a cornfield, if you had all the data from individual plants, would be 438 terabytes. Wow. Okay. Well, that certainly puts things in perspective. So, But it's exciting to see the technology and the way that it's being applied and the difference that it's making for farmers across this country in terms of productivity and the yields. and. Um, pretty staggering. So, well, thank you all for your for your remarks. Uh, we're going to ask you a, a few questions and try and get a little discussion uh, going here. And I'll uh, start off and then yield to my uh, colleague, Senator Fisher. But uh, Commissioner Carr, um, at previous hearings, we've discussed the importance of the federal programs that are available uh, to carriers to help with deployment of reliable broadband services. And last year, the FCC took several positive steps to put the federal universal service programs on a more solid foundation for years to come. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on what steps the Commission took, how those actions uh, will help expand the availability of high-speed internet services in, uh, in rural America and places like South Dakota. Uh, thanks, Chairman Thu, for the question. We've been in the process at the FCC of reorienting the universal service program. For those that uh, don't know it, it's about a $10 billion a year fund that we uh, oversee and administer at the FCC. And we've been reorienting that funding towards truly unserved uh, and underserved communities and prioritizing them. 
Um, that's resulted, among other things, as we talked about, in uh, millions of dollars of new funding coming to South Dakota to serve uh, over 40,000 new locations with just one tranche of funding alone. And we were out on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. We were seeing some of those dollars being plowed right into the ground to be uh, trenching fiber, uh, pulling conduit, and connecting communities. And when you step back and think of the broader economic impact that comes from these federal dollars, we are being good stewards of it. We're policing waste, fraud, and abuse. And it is uh, expanding uh, economic opportunity everywhere uh, where this funding is supporting build out. Well, thanks for doing it. And uh, I think that the, with the announcement uh, a few weeks ago, uh, South Dakota alone over the next decade, we're looking at about $700 million that should be deployed, uh, which will make a huge difference in a lot of, a lot of places in rural South Dakota. Uh, Mr. Snyder, um, fixed wireless services also have been a part of the solution to bring high-speed services to rural uh, South Dakota. Could you talk about your role in installing wireless towers and how they are used to help close the digital divide? Sure. So if you think about uh, tower sites, you have capacity sites and you have uh, uh, coverage sites. So coverage is like trying to fill the white spaces and capacity is we have too many people in one area, we need to put a lot of sites. And we have both problems in the US and there's only so many dollars to be spent uh, from AT&T, Verizon and, and people like that or even uh, or fiber broadband. So they have to decide where, where are we gonna put it? Um, so what Vicor does is we go out and put those towers up wherever the money is. But like, for example, uh, Vi Verizon has to decide, are we gonna spend it in Minneapolis or Myrtle? Are we gonna spend it in Pine Ridge or Portland? And so sometimes the white spaces get neglected because there's only so much. But we have this workforce just, we're going wherever, wherever we go, wherever we have to go and, and putting these vertical structures up um, and uh, we still have a long ways to go, but uh, thankfully we have a lot of help from the federal government, more so now than we've ever had. Mr. Schlenta, uh, and just to continue on the conversation on the build out of uh, broadband services, SDN's owner uh, companies, which include many of the uh, South Dakota independent telephone companies have been leaders in expanding uh, broadband services throughout some of the most rural parts of the state. How have you been able to leverage some of the federal opportunities available, and what do uh, these opportunities mean for uh, rural consumers and businesses? Thank you, Senator. And I would just like to comment, as I was uh, listening to my other panelists uh, speak, uh, and uh, Commissioner Carr, when you were a mile underground, the fiber connection that, supplies, that is supplied at the mine through SDN Communications. Hmm. The university campuses that Mr. Adeline talked about, Dr. Griffiths talks about, through SDN Communications. The eCare Center uh, that Avera operates, again, through, uh, through SDN Communications and many of those towers that uh, Mr. Snyder talks about uh, come, come from the backbone connections and the last mile connections of the independent phone companies uh, owned by SDN Communications. But coming back to your question on, uh, on uh, again, federal uh, programs, I touched on uh, the ReConnect uh, uh, program, which is uh, uh, through the Department of Agriculture. It was uh, $600 million to help uh, expand uh, broadband across the country. And in our state, uh, to my knowledge, there were three applications. And that's uh, one example of how, again, through the Department of Agriculture, um, if the, we are successful in those applications, we'll take uh, new high-speed facilities, fiber facilities, uh, uh, we might serve last mile in a combination of fiber and radio, uh, but it will be a, a delivering services uh, to locations that don't have a facility today. And so I think about the opportunities that will be opened up uh, through those types of grants. Uh, you know, the, the telehealth connection that Commissioner Carr talked about uh, from your home and how the world will be starting to change and will consume telehealth from our homes. Those kinds of services will be opened up in areas that frankly are the most remote and those are the people who have to travel the furthest distances to find their health care services. When you, go to those uh, when you go to those communities and you, and you see the kids in those communities, uh, you know, their ability to go home and do homework is uh, negatively impacted because they don't have access to, uh, to the broadband infrastructure. Um, the parents can't do online banking. 
you know, some of the things that uh, we take advantage of uh, right from our own kitchen tables can't be accomplished in those areas. So I look at those programs, just to reconnect as one example, as ways to continue to uh, extend uh, broadband facilities into, uh, into new areas and ultimately help uh, reach that goal, like you talked about at the very beginning, of trying to, find, trying to deliver broadband services really to everybody who wants it. And uh, some of those areas, um, because of the density, the remoteness, and the cost to get there, really without support uh, through some of the federal programs, it's just, it's, it's not attainable, uh, I'll say through the commercial markets. So we do appreciate the different programs that are put together, and just the Department of Ag was one example. And you touched on the continuing uh, support from the FCC that is now coming through the, the $700 million over the next decade. Uh, Dr. Griffiths, having access to reliable broadband has allowed uh, a lot of higher ed institutions to integrate technology uh, into their curricula, and it's key to helping students and faculty stay at the forefront of innovative research. DSU has many exciting uh, projects, including the Wireless Mobile Computing Initiative, um, which provides new students with a tablet that they can use throughout the school year to create a more interactive classroom environment. Uh, could you kind of tell us how uh, that program has supplemented students' uh, learning experience? Thank you very much for the question, um, Senator. Yes, uh, every one of the students coming to South, uh, the University of South Dakota, Dakota State University, did it again. Uh, Dakota State University is given um, a laptop when they acquire, when they come, and it's a, a pretty high-end laptop. Um, what that allows us to do is to ensure that everybody has the capability they need to go to the various classes that we offer. We know those computers are, are capable of uh, carrying the software and the applications that those students need. They're required to use our laptops for two years, and after that they can, they can swap out and take something else. Um, it, it really makes a difference when everybody has um, access to the same technology. So we don't have to run around and uh, uh, have different sort of maintenance agreements. We maintain those laptops too, by the way. We maintain uh, the same uh, equipment for uh, uh, Lake Area Technical College. So um, because we, are, we have the, the volume of activity that we have our own maintenance program for those uh, laptops. But it does allow the students in class to get access to a variety of different resources, the virtual labs, the uh, advanced computer simulations that put them into a sort of a virtual reality environment so that they can actually practice and see things in three dimensions as opposed to just reading, reading about it in a book. So there are lots of applications in the educational sphere that require people to have just even a base level of technology. And our students can go anywhere on campus and they can connect and they love staying on campus. I should say it's had an impact on um, the students wanting to live on campus. And now we're seeing more and more of our upperclassmen wanting to come back and live on campus because of the amenities we provide. And I'm sure it's not just the laundry. I'm sure it's not just the gaming suite. I'm sure the uh, a access to a reliable high-speed broadband is, is a key factor in their wanting to come back and live on campus. Very good. Um, yeah, I would think as a college student trying to pinch pennies that free Wi-Fi would be a pretty big incentive. But um, Ms. Larson, telehealth services have dramatically expanded the improvement, as we noted earlier, broadband services in rural America, and you touched on that in your remarks. But how have you uh, seen this expansion transform the patients and healthcare providers' experience in areas that have lacked sufficient healthcare services, particularly uh, specialty care services? Well, thank you, Senator Thune. Um, specialty care services specific. Um, so I'll just use a, a case right here in, in, in South Dakota. Um, cancer care, cancer care. We did actually find out at Avera that there actually was an area going um, really north of Pier and Redfield um, all the way down through Valentine that was really uh, lacking access to cancer care. And we really needed to, you know, you either needed to be on the east side of the state or the west side of the state. And um, actually understanding, uh, if you understood the recruitment process for the cancer care team, um, it's a, first of all those individuals, there's only a few of them trained in that way and they're hard to recruit and they need a population to serve. So um, we had an experience, we have many E, we, we talk about, you know, we can put E consult, E in front of almost any specialist, but we Actually, then uh, the, the hardest one for me was when one of the CEOs came and said, can we do e-radiation oncology? 
that's a group of about five physicians who need to be available to do a radiation treatment. And it was a pretty big undertaking. It was um, how do you actually, first of all, do we have that kind of, do we have the broadband space to um, make sure we have the PAX imaging and all of those pieces going perfectly? And can we actually provide enough um, visual viewing for, um, for a physician to be able to see the patient? And in this case, it was in Pierce, South Dakota, to do um, radiation oncology treatment from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, or from Aberdeen, or now from, um, from uh, Yankton. Interestingly enough, we actually were able to um, provide the right camera space to afford us the opportunity to use a specialist who wants to have a wide, wants to have enough population to serve that they feel comfortable after those decades of learning and, and actually um, training to do that service that they have enough population to serve. So we now have that capability um, through technology um, on the telehealth where the physician can look into the vault and see the patient, see a lot of technology, making sure that it's um, exactly the way it's supposed to be and that they can actually provide the treatment uh, from the physician here in Sioux Falls and in uh, patient in peer. Why is that important? Because in that space that I just described from um, water, or I'm sorry, uh, Redfield going down to Valentine, there were many women, I'll just use uh, cancer care for breast cancer, just deciding to forego that treatment. Um, don't do the radiation oncology, it takes a month. And it's a Monday through Friday thing and you don't feel good after you have that done. So maybe I'll just do a complete mastectomy or I just won't do the care because my husband needs me on the farm, my partner needs me to do these things, take care of the children, et cetera. So now with that access, we've actually seen an increase in radiation oncology in peer um, it's, it's more than 50% more than what we anticipated it would be. So that means that those, those treatments for radiation oncology in Pierce, South Dakota are going on at home. So that's just a, it's a very special technology, a very special specialty, if you will, create, needing five different specialists that would have been able to, not been able to be recruited to peer to provide that service had it not been for telehealth. Dr. Adeline, uh, understand that uh, SDSU offers the first in the nation Bachelor of Science in Precision Agriculture. Uh, you talked about this uh, earlier, but could you just maybe further describe the intersection between new technologies and agriculture and what that means for a South Dakota farmer? Yeah, bring it home to the farm. You bet. Um, so if, you, if you're looking at what we think uh, might be a savings or um, return on value. We, we believe that um, for the average corn producer, they could see a 10 to 15 percent increase in profit by the use of technologies, um, precision ag technology. And for the soybean and wheat producer, we could see a 5 to 10 percent increase in profit for that. But I also like to mention what I think is an intangible. Uh, senators, you know that farmers and ranchers are real stewards of the land, right? And with precision agriculture, it allows them to sharpen that to the point where they're, they're taking even better care of what they believe they want to pass on and take good care of. It, it allows them to do that even more so. So I think that will be a, an intangible benefit that all of us will reap because of their efforts. Great. Thank you. Senator Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Larson, I'd like to follow up a little bit on the questions uh, about what Avera eCare uh, is able to provide, especially to uh, patients in homes throughout the un underserved, unserved uh, rural areas of the state. Uh, your company has a great history in telemedicine. Uh, I guess I'm really interested in the lessons that you've learned and how you've uh, achieved some success in reaching, I believe, over 300 communities. I know there's challenges that you've faced along the way. I'm specifically interested in how have you overcome the challenges in terms of scaling hospital to patient internet connections across rural America? And who have you partnered with in that endeavor? <clears throat> Well, first of all, I'd, I'd want to make sure that I mentioned here um, that we are very 
um, dependent upon some of the federal funding, um, USAC funding as an example, as we find a rural community hospital that really could be eligible to decrease their the cost of the monthly cost of their services. We make sure we introduce them to those that opportunity and um, assist them in any way that we can to um, research the USAC funding. We of course also use USDA. We, we know a lot about what USDA will fund as far as the technology that's needed in those communities and we lean into that heavily and help others understand that as well. It's, it's interesting when you get into rural communities how many of those funds that may be available to them they're not familiar with. So as an organization we do quite a bit of that. So who have we partnered with? Um, we often, the, so what have we learned first and who have we partnered with? Um, last mile connectivity was mentioned just a little bit earlier. So it's, it's often can we get, when we're in Kansas and we need to get to Wichita, is there anything in between there for broadband and how do we do that better? How, so sometimes we actually put help, reach out to Mark. Mark helps us a lot with where the circuitry is, what's available there in those states and those communities. and. Sometimes we, we will partner either with Mark and our local telco to understand what it is we need to do to get that last uh, broadband into that hospital to make sure that we have continuous connectivity. So um, in many times, uh, broadband uh, that last mile will be what will wait a number, a number of months to actually get that last connection. Uh, we may be up and ready to go, and it will take another couple of months for that last mile connectivity to go for various reasons. But I would say um, uh, maybe Mark can comment a bit on what those reasons are a little deeper, but that is often a holdup that we don't have that last mile connectivity. So we've learned to try to plan ahead, ahead of that. Um, there's a lot of other issues with telehealth, meaning uh, physician licensure, those kinds of things, but we try to space that very carefully so that once a rural provider decides that they need some support in their community with telemedicine, they've been through a lot of discernment to get there, and so they would like to have it next month. So it takes a little bit of time to help them understand what that, what, what that will require. Okay, so let's go to the last mile again. <laughs> when, when we look at the last mile and, and we understand the challenges that are out there, a lot of times it is with funding, of course, but uh, when the need is so great, how are we going to get there? Well, that, that's a great question. So I, you kept bringing it up. So. Well, yeah. yeah. There we go. So now I get to answer the question. Yeah. Uh, help, us, help us figure out how we can get these services to areas that uh, truly need them. Well, you know, I, I, I think the, one of the first things we have to do is uh, really examine uh, the data sets we use to identify the areas that are in need. Uh, for uh, for broadband connectivity, you know we've all worked through a series of uh, of data collection. Uh, we've moved it up, uh, you know, upstream. But I think as uh, as we move forward, uh, getting data at the location level, which is a be a huge granular effort. But if not at the location level, then certainly using uh, shape files to better uh, better coordinate the geography where broadband exists and broadband doesn't exist. So. We'll, I think the, being able to use good data uh, will be part of our steps. Uh, and then as we start to identify those, I think it's, um, I feel personally, um, what are the types of applications that can be uh, uh, created in those communities? Communities that have a clinic, communities that have schools, um, communities that have banks should be some of the ones that we start to prioritize toward as a, a way to start to uh, put the, uh, the funds that we have available in those markets first and we continue to work out from there. And I think that'll become a combination of last mile and middle mile uh, that'll be needed in order to accomplish that because we can't have really all of these last mile roads leading into choke points uh, within a state. So we have to also make sure we're uh, providing an examination and support for uh, a robust middle mile network. Thank you. Um, Ms. Larson, rural uh, mental health Care is, um, I think, a, a huge void that we see across my state. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you see that in, in South Dakota as well. Uh, how, how are we going to make sure that, um, with all the advantages we see here with telehealth, uh, that we are able to have professionals be available to rural uh, communities as well when it 
when it uh, comes to mental health. Um, do you think do you think telemedicine has a place in that, and how can how can we move that forward? Uh, thank you for that question because it is absolutely a need in every community that we go to. It's one of the first questions that's asked. Right now, we're undergoing <clears throat> a pilot project <clears throat> to really support and understand how to best serve those needs. <clears throat> Oftentimes, the need shows up either with first responder, um, uh, police or sheriff's departments, and or in the emergency departments. So uh, oftentimes, these things escalate into a situation where individuals may be transferred um, or jailed because jail is the only place that anyone feels safe to put them. There's no one else in the rural community area that or no other place where um, uh, the sheriff or the individuals feel safe to put them. So we're, we're very concerned about that. The pilots that we're looking at are actually ride along <clears throat> types of opportunities, meaning iPads, if you will, um, that are with a, a county sheriff um, as they go to a scene, uh, go to a situation, um, maybe in a home where there's a call that's been made. And <clears throat> can we actually, and we can actually proven this, get that the individual who's <clears throat> causing that situation on an iPad interview, try to de-escalate the situation and make decisions about what is really needed. Do they need uh, acute therapy today, acute treatment into the hospital, really going that route? If they do, they should go immediately. If not, can we de-escalate that enough to do an ambulatory process the next day? Not making them go to jail, which usually escalates things worse and just causes a whole nother scenario of issues. So our focus right now is to create that team that can be the ride along with the sheriff. We're not doing municipal police departments at this point, we're doing county sheriffs. What can we do in that area as an initial point? The other thing we think about that is if we can reduce the assessments that actually need to go to the hospital setting, we can keep the sheriffs off the highway and keep them in their home communities or in their home counties. What, what do you think we can do at the federal level um, to, change, to change policy that would offer better support? Um, <clears throat> part of that is, I, I think the treatment plans and the reimbursement plans, you know, where, where the treatment often ends up to be um, a situation of uh, who's going to pay for that treatment and where do they go. So that's where a lot of incarceration occurs and that escalation goes on there. So if um, part of this for telehealth is the reimbursement of telehealth and how can that reimbursement change into um, maybe therapists being reimbursed differently, um, as well as mid-level providers being reimbursed differently and being able to, uh, because the, the group of psychiatrists is a pretty small group. They can lead all of this care and oversight the care um, provided by the rest of the individuals. But I think if we could have a broader um, scope of who can do some of those services, um, it would make eligibility a lot more available. Do you know if your state is looking into uh, making any changes to scope of practice that would be beneficial? You know, it's very state to state. Right, right. now, um, we actually have a lot of access in the state of South Dakota to do many of those services in South Dakota. Good. Uh, Commissioner Carr, nice to see you again. Thank you for uh, coming out to South Dakota. Thank you for being in Nebraska. Um, and thank you for your leadership on the commission when it comes to rural issues. Um, you and Chairman Pai and Commissioner O'Reilly are, are always out uh, doing these road trips. We'll get you back to Nebraska. Uh, I think it's, I think it's uh, wonderful that you do that and I appreciate it. Um, you have, um, I think, been a leader when it comes to creating the Connected Care Pilot Program. And I know our seniors and our veterans that live um, far from populous cities, they have to not only overcome that digital divide, but they have to uh, also ha overcome a patient-doctor divide as well. And to be able to distribute healthcare uh, across this divide, I think, would improve our patient outcomes. It's going to reduce costs, which we're all very concerned about. But it, it's going to help the patient. To the extent that you're able, can you provide further details on just where you, at, you are at um, with proceeding with it and how interested participants uh, could expect to benefit from this program? Just a great update would be helpful. 
Certainly. Uh, thank you, Senator, for the question, and thank you uh, as well for your leadership in pushing on you know, health care for rural parts of the country and, and rural broadband, the connection. I think there's uh, a, a focus uh, for some reason on this hearing on Valentine, Nebraska, and I have a story that uh, is relevant to that. When we were now down... you're in South Dakota, remember. That's so. right. When we were in, uh, and I'll bridge the gap between the two. Okay. When we were in uh, Pine Ridge uh, yesterday uh, at the IHS facility, uh, there's a woman, Connie, who lives in Valentine, and she's a mental health, behavioral health uh, specialist. And she's able to video conference in, and she works from her home in Valentine as a mental health, behavioral health specialist. It has uh, video uh, calls, video uh, conferences uh, with folks on the reservation from there because of that connection. And what we've seen is when you're able to move the provision of care outside the four corners of a brick and mortar facility, uh, it opens it up to people that can't make those travels to a health care provider, particularly in the Great Plains in the winter. Uh, with some of the weather, it's not possible. What we've seen in trials to date on connected care pilots, which are delivering care directly to people, uh, for every dollar that's been invested in those pilots, there's been a $3 return in terms of savings. Uh, and of course, significant improvements in outcomes, whether it's measured in bed days for people not having to end up in the highest cost center of our healthcare system, which is the emergency department, um, or, or improvements in their lives. At the FCC, we're doing a couple things. One, we're continuing to support uh, through subsidies, connections to hospitals. And we're now, as you asked, standing up this pilot program. We voted uh, just in July, I believe, to move forward with that. It's the second to last step in our process, which is a notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, and then we'll move to an order, hopefully within the next few months. And then we'll be opening up to applications. So we're really reaching out to uh, healthcare providers uh, to make them aware of the program, aware of the opportunities, to encourage them to apply for the program for funding because uh, we do think it can make a big uh, difference, to your point, uh, with bridging this doctor divide. We see rural hospitals closing by the dozen around the country. And if we can replace some of that uh, with access to a doctor located uh, somewhere else, whether it's a big city, um, that can make a real difference. When you, when you look at funding for rural hospitals, does the uh, critical access designation play, have a part to play in the formula? Yeah, we're working through exactly how we should define the areas that we're targeting and we're open to ideas. One thing we've seen so far is some of the definitions don't always line up. I was uh, with Senator Capita in West Virginia and we were, uh, I live in Madison, West Virginia, which is a pretty rural remote community, but for some reason it is pulled into Charleston, West Virginia for a lot of uh, funding decisions and therefore is not considered rural and remote. So there may be some steps we need to take uh, with measuring what is rural uh, that reflects uh, more of the practical experience on the ground. And then as was mentioned, some of the licensing and reimbursement issues uh, might be some low-hanging fruit, uh, maybe not low-hanging, but some fruit to target at the federal level to make it easier to deliver care across state lines. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could I ask Absolutely. one more? Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, Mr. Schlanta, uh, Nebraska's Broadband Task Force has been analyzing ways to improve broadband mapping throughout our state especially in the wake of difficulties with the FCC's Mobility Fund 2 challenge process. And I think we've made really good strides at the state level, but there still is a focus on solving this at the federal level. So given the FCC's authority to compel reporting changes that providers submit for their coverage areas, how can we improve uh, accountability for providers submitting information on their coverage areas while also ensuring that there is a robust challenge process to fine-tune what we actually have with broadband coverage and connections. Another great question, I know, I'm Senator. giving you all these uh, <laughs> tough ones here. It's so all right. Um, this gets down to the bones here it, now, though. So. You know, it, it does. And I, you know, I'm not a mobile carrier, so I'm not one who uh, provides those uh, those reports that you're, you're talking about, those coverages. Uh, but I, I do think, uh, I think back to a, uh, an effort that took place in South Dakota a number of years ago, and it took place, at, again, at the state level, so maybe similar to what's happening in Nebraska, where um, the state uh, went out and mapped areas for uh, broadband connectivity speeds from the wireless carriers. In addition to those uh, broadband speeds, you know, it helped uh, just identify areas where there where coverage existed and coverage did not exist. So I, I, I think one of the keys are gonna be, you know, how do, you know, actually some kind of funding to put some boots on the ground, to go out and take some different measurements um, 
and, uh, and, and get that, that data reported back. And I don't think that's a, something you can rely on the consumer to do. I think it'll take uh, an effort of professional to go out to the field and take some of those, uh, of those measurements. Because at the end of the day, it comes to, I think what you're trying to get to is that good data that I've talked about so that you can make those right decisions on where those investments are needed to expand the coverage, um, expand the broadband deployments, all of those things uh, ultimately roll up to having good data. Yeah, if, I mean, if we're going to take advantage of precision agriculture, if we're going to be able to do all the cool stuff with the Internet of Things, um, we have to have that coverage, and we can only get that, I believe, we can only get that coverage if we have uh, dependable um, maps that are going to be available so we can make good decisions. Uh, the FCC can make good decisions on just where this funding is uh, needed and where it should be targeted. I do think, um, you know, from an Internet of Things standpoint, uh, maybe access to uh, precision, precision ag sensors, uh, you know, wireless coverage is one way to accomplish uh, getting that data uh, distributed. I also think for, for some operators, um, you know, being connected to their terrestrial uh, network and having perhaps their own um, say somewhat radio network to cover their fields uh, will, be, will, will be one solution so that you have that coverage in those areas where that precision ag operator is, is uh, really pr producing their, their crops. And just to touch on uh, precision agriculture, I did hear one of uh, Dr. Adeline's uh, um, colleagues last month talk about uh, really the need for uh, more robust broadband speeds at, at agricultural locations, farms and ranches. Uh, he was suggesting speeds of 100, 100, uh, 100 up, 100 down is needed to be able to take that data that Dr. Adeline was talking about you know, that those images and things, get them uploaded, get them processed, and get the answers returned in a time frame that the ag producer can act upon the data. You know, three days later, sometimes the window of opportunity for the ag producer has passed. So I do think um, um, the speeds that uh, help define broadband are something we're going to need to continue to examine as well in the, in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Fisher. Uh, Mr. Schlant, uh, one thing you'll find out about my colleague from Nebraska, she always asks hard questions. <laughs> and they're not confined just to witnesses. Um, <laughs> uh, could you just, for, and this is just for purposes of uh, many of us who don't uh, traffic in the language, and, but an example of middle mile versus last mile when you're building that out in a, in a community. Can you explain that or somebody that well, um, March by the best? Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, so using uh, South Dakota as an example, and then I'll, I'll transition to Nebraska uh, as well for those who are a little more familiar with Nebraska. But in South Dakota, you know, I touch on the independent phone companies. And as I touched on in my comments, they serve about 80% of the state's land mass. And so think of them as uh, their, I would consider them the last mile provider taking the connectivity out to the farm, the ranch, the tower, the bank, the hospital, whatever is in the community where that service is needed. They'll aggregate uh, all those different data connections back into a couple of key locations in their markets. But carriers like SDN uh, then come along. We, we connect those independent companies. So we provide that backbone connectivity uh, across the state and then ultimately deliver it to points outside the state. Uh, uh, places like, uh, well, and content providers like Facebook or, uh, uh, you know, other internet providers, they have limited connectivity uh, available to them in the state of South Dakota. So we help carry that to points beyond the state so we can get on those national backbones so that we can go straight from that national backbone right into that hospital, home, um, you know, that's in those markets. So the middle mile carrier, we, we bundle it all up and we carry it across the state and out of the state so that we can get on those national networks. Nebraska, as I, as I touched on, they have a similar network, uh, uh, Nebraska Link. Uh, fewer number of companies, but they're working really to accomplish the same things that we do here in South Dakota. And did I hear you say uh, 50,000? 50,000 miles of uh, fiber facilities um, uh, collectively across yeah. SDN and its, and its member companies. So like I said, circling the world twice right here in the state of South Dakota, taking those high-speed connections out to uh, farms, ranches, banks, uh, anywhere it needs to be. It's a lot of fiber. It is. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, you mentioned in this follow-up on Senator Fisher's question, but this the, the need for more accurate mapping. Um, and one of the reasons we need that is to prevent overbuilding and avoid some of the mistakes that have been made in the past. So how, how do we, what steps do you think we need to take to prevent overbuilding? And, um, and then I'd like to have uh, Commissioner Carr uh, maybe follow up on that. How do we get better coordination between the federal agencies? We've talked about USDA and the FCC, both of which have programs and resources that are targeted at uh, deployment of high-speed services in rural areas. But to prevent some of the mistakes of the past and get broadband um, out there in, in, the, in the most efficient way possible, um, how do we avoid the overbuilding? We've talked about, you know, we always hear that. Uh, we want to make sure that we're deploying resources in the best way possible to the places that need it the most. Well, again, I'll, I'll go back to, uh, I think location data is one of the, the key pieces. But when you think of all of the locations across the country, that's a huge undertaking. So then I start to break that down into shape files. Uh, uh, you know, where, do the, where does that infrastructure exist? Uh, I think no matter how hard we try, we're going to end up with, I'll say, some level of, uh, of overbuilding. Someone's going to have built a facility that didn't get reported, and then it's going to look like it was uh, perhaps uh, an inefficient use of, uh, of programs or funds. But if that if that's existing facility maybe provides connectivity to a single location or uh, is limited to what it's accomplishing, is it really ultimately meeting its full need? So um, first I would say we, we need to work hard, but we need to recognize that there will probably be some level that, that ultimately exists. But I do think the census block data at the right time, or at, at the beginning of trying to gather this data may have been the right uh, granular level. Um, I think it's, it's shown us uh, there are flaws in that, in that, especially in big census blocks across the country, and we need to start to move that into uh, the next granular step, which I would say is a shape file, and then beyond that, a location. You know, what locations are served at what speed? If you can get to that level of data, we'll be able to make the right decisions. Commissioner, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I'd agree with a lot of that. I think we've heard loud and clear, both from providers and uh, from leaders in Congress, we have to do a better job at our maps, that's going to help address some of the overbuilding issues. We're also coordinating, I think, better with some of the other agencies on this. We had maps, as was noted, um, at a census track level uh, for at least 10 years, maybe more. And as was noted, they may have made a lot of sense back then for the purposes they were serving, but we've come to rely on those maps pretty heavily to make effectively billion dollar funding decisions. So we've, uh, at the FCC, decided to turn the page on some of those older mapping approaches and we're launching into a new, more granular approach, whether it's shape files or otherwise, to get a lot better data. So I think in DC, there's often uh, inertia of you know, adding another Christmas ornament to an existing process and not starting from scratch. I think we get it that we basically need to start from scratch with our maps. Keep the ones that we have for the purposes that they're good for, but let's launch into a more accurate approach. And I think I should note as well, while you know, we're here at Southeast Tech, when we talk about building out these networks, I know you've been a strong leader for these workforce development issues. And as I mentioned, the tower crews alone could absorb another uh, 20,000 uh, workers right now. These are good paying jobs. And uh, Southeast is looking at adding uh, a tower tech program. And have you spoken in favor of it? Uh, and I have as well. And we got a briefing before this hearing on how uh, that is progressing and moving forward. And hopefully will result ultimately uh, in a tower training program here. It would save costs a lot on the industry that's looking to hire them make sure that people are comfortable working at heights and some of the travel associated with this job. So I think that would be great. And I also just want to recognize, you know, Craig and his whole team. A lot of people as we've talked, they turn their cell phone on, they expect it to work, they assume it's magic or pixie dust, and they don't realize that, you know, it's America's hardworking men and women that are the tower techs that are climbing the towers, that are building this out. And I spent some time with his teams, uh, Brandon, Leland, Am and Mike, uh, across the state and really across the country, and they're doing great work. And as I said in my statement, you know, what it takes to build out these networks is thankfully what rural America has in spades. Uh, it's hard work, it's grit, it's determination. Uh, and there's another provider I wanted to mention that, that I saw is here, Tyler, uh, who I met a couple years ago uh, here, I guess a year or so ago. Uh, he lives out in uh, Parker, South Dakota. And he runs a, at least back then, ran a very small wireless internet service provider. He was trying to solve his own digital divide and get service to his old family farm. 
set up a wireless connection, decided to go into business helping his community. He took me up on the water tower above Parker and showed me some of the people that he's been able to connect. And so we do a lot of work at the FCC and you do to set the right policies. Uh, and then it takes hard work and sometimes duct tape and bailing wire to actually bridge that last mile. Uh, and so just very thankful for the crews that are out there uh, building this infrastructure out. I think that's why being here today, emphasizing the potential to stand up uh, a training program to create a pipeline for these 5G workers uh, would be a really good step. Thanks, and I, I, it shouldn't be lost on anybody why we're at Southeast Technical <laughs> Institute today. Was they, they, uh, we are very hopeful about that program and, and hope that they can get it launched because I do think there's a huge demand out there and Craig and his team and uh, others who are in this business can attest to that. Uh, and having a prepared workforce in what would be very good paying jobs and uh, I guess as long as you can handle uh, some heights. Uh, what, what, how far can you see from the top of the water tower in Parker anyway? Is that yeah, you had a pretty good view from, from up there in Parker, uh, at least, I don't know, 15, 20 miles from up there. A yeah. good 20 miles, okay. Thankfully, when I was with uh, some of Craig's crew on top of the, the KDLT broadcast tower, the 2,000-foot tower, thankfully it was snowing that day, so you couldn't see very far, <laughs> which made it a lot easier on my fear of heights. Yeah. Well, it's a big, it is a big, um, the, the workforce is a big challenge in, in a lot of, uh, across sectors of industry right now, but certainly uh, this one is, uh, is one where we really need the help. And I'm, like I said, I, we have a, if nothing else, um, a very uh, capable, uh, professional, skilled, and uh, people with a powerful work ethic here in South Dakota that can fill a lot of those positions. So they just need to make, we need to make sure we get them trained. And I hope that the, the, pro the project here at uh, STI ends up uh, coming to fruition. Um, let me ask you very quickly, uh, T-Mobile Sprint. Good for rural areas. They've made a lot of commitments and promises. Can the FCC uh, enforce uh, that uh, when this thing comes to? Yeah, I think this transaction is another really good win, both for the administration and for us at the FCC, in this really global race to 5G. Uh, from our perspective, big cities, New York, San Francisco, are going to get 5G almost no matter what any of us do. The challenge is getting into every community. And with this transaction and the FCC uh, looking to approve the transaction, they've secured a commitment to build out 5G to 99 percent of the U.S. population. So that's solving uh, a digital divide that would be difficult to bridge otherwise. So I think uh, that's going to be a really good deal for U.S. leadership. I, I want to ask um, just Dr. Griffiths if I can, because I think this ties into all these discussions, but uh, DSU has been a leader, as you pointed out, in cybersecurity throughout the state and the region, and each year the university is producing more and more graduates with the tech skills that are necessary necessary to participate in that modern workforce. Earlier this year, I introduced the Cybersecurity Exchange Act, which is legislation aimed at allowing uh, for the recruitment of cyber experts in both the private sector and academia. As more South Dakotans go online and more innovations become a reality, how important is, is it that our cybersecurity capabilities and cyber workforce uh, keep pace? And uh, what would you say are some of the ways that we ought to be investing? Well, thank you for the question, um, and I'm, I'm familiar with the legislation that was introduced. Um, I, I, I think cybersecurity is often forgotten in this world of, you know, getting connectivity. Um, the applications that we've heard about today in healthcare and in precision agriculture um, have security needs. Um, unfortunately, at Dakota State, we have to think about bad actors, and uh, it's very easy to think about how bad actors can interfere with the flow of services and the flow of information back and forth that enable these kinds of applications. And, and you've heard me speak, I know, about agriculture as a critical infrastructure in the United States, or in any country for that matter, and how, um, how vulnerable it is. I think uh, what we're trying to do, in a way, in higher education, we have the luxury of, of thinking ahead, right? We aren't responsible for providing all the infrastructure and the services, but we have the luxury of thinking ahead because we're educating people for jobs that don't really exist yet and trying to say what happens next. So I'm intrigued, um, you know, we've been talking for decades about the last mile and we've talked about it a lot today. We talk about the last inch. How do you get ensure that secu 
so that applications and information is secure to the last inch as we have people with more and more devices that are connecting to the network. We have more and more wearable devices that are going to be critical in long-term care as the population ages in place. Um, so I think it's even more important than ever before. And the need for experts in the area of cybersecurity, I mean, uh, you know, as, is, as I've indicated, we have plans to, uh, to double the size of uh, our program. So we uh, double, the, double the number of graduates. I'm sure other programs around the country are doing the same. We've, um, we've been working to form a, um, a national um, network of uh, cybersecurity programs in higher education so we can sort of leverage the strengths that we each have and begin to uh, provide more support to each other and also perhaps answer the call if it comes um, from the federal sector. You need support from our, our uh, experts, our expert faculty, or some of our students who also um, have expertise and, and uh, uh, security clearances can jump in as necessary. But um, I don't think cybersecurity is going to become less and less of an issue. It's going to become more and more important as we move forward. Thank you, and I couldn't agree more. I just think that it's, we trade, we want the connectivity, we want the speed and all that comes with that, but we also have to be aware that there are bad actors out there and uh, cybersecurity and making sure we slam those doors shut is really critical. And you are preparing uh, the folks that are gonna be uh, helping us do that in the future, so thank you for doing that. Um, Senator Fisher, anything else you wanna ask? No, I just would like to thank you, uh, Senator Thune, for holding the field hearing. Um, again, it was a pleasure to be here. I think it was an excellent hearing. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you for, thank you for coming up and, and making the trip. We appreciate it. Uh, anybody on the panel, any thoughts, uh, closing comments, anything you didn't, you, that we didn't address that you think should be addressed or uh, observations or comments you'd like to make as we sort of wind it down here? If I can make, yes. Senator, one, one quick thing. Dr. Adelaide. Um, so in 2004, when I took over at SDSU, we had 12 megs of bandwidth for research. We have 100 gig now. Hmm. So as we think about broadband, I can't tell you what those applications are, but I can tell you our researchers and faculty are eating up bandwidth and data is flowing big time. So we really have to think um, where this thing might go way into the future. Yeah, right, yeah. If I could add on to uh, Dr. Adeline's uh, comments, uh, uh, we too are seeing the throughputs on, uh, uh, on connections from homes, ranches, uh, essentially doubling every, every two to three years. Uh, so the amount of bandwidth that is consumed by uh, a household uh, goes up. And you touched on things like the Internet of Things, those are various devices. Those are all contributors to the amount of data that moves. Uh, I do think as well, those speeds that Dr. Adeline talked about, and, and I'm saying speeds in the last mile are gonna be key to us I'll say, staying ahead of the advances in the applications. We can create all the applications we want, but if we can't move the data, uh, they're not useful to us. So I would encourage uh, Congress and the FCC to continue to look at what are those right thresholds uh, for uh, data speeds that should be our minimums for uh, setting good broadband policy. Thank you. Yes. I would add, uh, one piece, um, as we talked about the cybersecurity, it's certainly important in healthcare, has been described, and we uh, actually are forced to carry cyber insurance. Um, you know, if we if we do get held ransom, we have to have some way out of that. As we travel the the rural uh, communities and and ask the hospitals, we we actually require them to have a kind of an entry level, if you will, of cyber insurance, and um, there are so many who've not thought about it, not heard about it, so where can I get that? They go to their bank and the bank hasn't heard about it or done anything about it. So the awareness and the um, access to it. Um, entry level is, uh, I believe, for most that have come back to us to say we can't find any, is a $10 million, and so that's um, pretty expensive for those critical access facilities. So it's an issue, it's again something, I'm not sure how to address it, but it is something of concern for us as, as we do uh, enter into the healthcare arena. Anything else, guys? Good, well, I want to, uh, again, I'll tell, just if anybody wants to add to the record, um, if there are 
any additional questions that we want to submit or anything, we will keep the hearing record open uh, for a period of time to enable that to happen. And I do want to thank uh, the Commerce Committee. We have uh, several people out here from the Chairman Wicker's staff, Olivia is here, um, and Trustee Stephanie Gamash somewhere over here running the operation, Jeff Johnson, uh, all of uh, work on the uh, on the Commerce Committee to make sure that uh, when we have these hearings, both in Washington, D.C. and around the country, that uh, it comes off smoothly and hopefully well. And so we appreciate uh, their presence here. Um, Alex Sack, you know, my staff uh, is a, does our Commerce Committee portfolio uh, in our office and is a, uh, a Burke, South Dakota native. So he was one of the fortunate ones. His uh, house, I think, uh, stayed together. You probably saw the, we had a, a bad tornado in Burke, South Dakota, it wiped out a lot of the Main Street and school and everything else. But um, anyway, does a great job for us. And I think Senator Fisher as well has somebody that does uh, her work on the Commerce Committee. So we appreciate the work that staff uh, does on a daily basis to, um, to hope, hopefully help us deal with what are very challenging issues and as we try and shape policies that will create a, a brighter and more prosperous future for people here in South Dakota, rural areas of our country. And uh, we're, uh, we're grateful for the contributions that uh, all the folks in this room uh, do to make that happen. So thank you for being here today. Uh, with that, we will adjourn. <laughs>